Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Redeemer. I got a little delayed there. Putting a mask on and off with one of these microphones is not as easy as it seems, so I <laughs> have to figure out how to do that. I just want to welcome you this morning. I said we we're kind of small but mighty. We are uh, the Church of God gathered in community around word and sacrament, and it's so good that you're here today on this Trinity Sunday. Now, a little bit of trivia about uh, Trinity Sunday. It's the only festival in the church year that's actually based on a doctrine and not an event. Uh, and what is that doctrine? It's the doctrine that, uh, of the Holy Trinity, and that is that our God is one God, yet three persons. Not three gods, one God. Three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so it's a great mystery of our faith. Um, you can keep yourself occupied if you'd like. If the sermon gets boring, just see if in your mind you can come up with yet another analogy of how to explain uh, the Holy Trinity. But it really is a fundamental part of our faith. If you ever played a sport, the coach always tells you to go back to the basics, right? That's how you win the championship, is by getting good at the fundamentals. I would say that the Holy Trinity is one of the fundamentals of our faith. It's a foundation on which all the rest of the building and our theology is laid. What a great thing it is that we have a holy God that is creator of all, father of all, that we have the Son, Jesus Christ, who is our Redeemer and Lord. And then we have the Holy Spirit, the Sanctifier, who makes us holy and comes to dwell within us, and we are forever changed by having him in us. That is the Holy Trinity. So when we get to the part of the service today where we're professing the creed, don't take it lightly. Recognize that those three parts of the creed are an explanation of that trinity in which we believe. So I'm really, good to have, really glad to have you here today for that. It's really something unique um, to Christianity, something you won't find in any stores. <laughs> All right. Hey, uh, I got a bunch of announcements, probably too many today, just to help you, especially those people um, who are here worshiping um, live and in person, and we can just all wave at the camera because we're also uh, being uh, broadcast right now, um, hopefully. That seems like it's working, right, Rochelle? <laughs> so we're being broadcast uh, to the internet, and uh, just really glad that you're here. But okay, so for those who are here this morning on the way in, you got checked. We really, if you have any fever or symptoms, we really want you to worship from the comfort of your home. Uh, we ask you to do that. It's the same website that we've had, uh, both rbts.online.church and um, our RBTS YouTube channel, but different times to match up with our actual live worship services. Of course, all that's available in recorded fashion after the live streaming ends. And this is something interesting. If you do come down or find out that you have COVID-19 at some point, we pray that that does not happen, um, and you've worshiped with us today, it'd be helpful for us to know that. So just let us know. Um, I'm asking, and I see everybody is doing a really good job. I'm asking, especially throughout this service, I'm not wearing my mask um, so that you can, you know, see me a little bit better. But you wearing your mask really protects me, especially during those parts of the service where we have spoken responses and uh, singing. So thank you for wearing that mask. Really the only time um, that you need to bring that down is for communion, and I'll be giving you a lot more instructions about that. Uh, social distancing, you know all about that. Try to stay six feet. We've marked the pews. That's, they're every three feet. So two complete three-foot sections between you and any other family groups. Um, air hugs only uh, for our time of greeting this morning. That's what you can do is just wave at your neighbor. Uh, make sure you can't touch them. Hand, hand sanitizer is located throughout. We even have one here uh, that you can use just before receiving communion. You've probably noticed that we've taken the printed resources out of the um, pews. So everything you need for the service is on the screen. Um, and if you did need an offering envelope or something for your kids or one of those hearing assist systems, we've got all that out at the supply station. None of that is um, self-service, so please ask if you want a portal of prayer. Ask if you need something for your children. And also, because one of the guidelines, as and again, I know it's disappointing, but as we are getting back and we're just kind of started doing this, we're keeping our services as short as possible. 
and also we're not going to be passing offering plates. So the QR code is on the screen. It's located in a couple different places throughout the church, or you can just remember to go to our website, the donate page, rbts, excuse me, redeemerbythesea.org slash donate, and uh, this might be a good time for you to make your donation. If you did miss the offering box on the way in, I'm told that the ushers are going to have it for you also um, on the way out. And we don't have paper, so you need to fill out your connection card online at redeemerbythesea.org slash connect. You can do it from your phone or from the comfort of your home. Um, don't fill it out four weeks from now because that kind of defeats the purpose. But you could fill it out and uh, it will get to the office and we'll follow up. We just love to know that you've been with us. And that goes for our online worshipers as well. Definitely let us know that you're with us today. All that same process, prayer requests, um, following up with the ministry, have any questions that we can help you with, that we still do all of that even now. Um, restrooms, please uh, use at your own risk. We're not cleaning them in between uses or anything like that. Maintain that social distancing. And we have no nursery this morning and no Sunday school or adult Bible studies. You can get Sunday school online at our online-worship site um, and watch those wonderful uh, Sunday school um, videos with your children uh, and get to see Miss Rhonda and our Sunday school teachers also, boy, it just keeps getting better, doesn't it? There's no coffee after the service. Uh, so again, we hope to be able to bring that back to you as soon as possible. But we're not having cookies and coffee, but what we are having is Holy Communion today. Can I get an amen? Um, and so I will have more detailed instructions for you right before then. That way I make sure you don't forget it. Uh, but the process, needless to say, as is everything else, is very different than what we've done. So you won't be coming up to the communion rails. We've got a special station set up. And uh, our elders have devised a sanitary, no-touch way of receiving um, the bread and the wine. And we do have gluten-free wafers, and also non-alcoholic wine available for you if you make an indication. Again, more of that coming at the time of the service. Uh, hope to see you maybe Wednesday morning at 9 a.m. on our Zoom study. You can uh, click the links and get uh, the Zoom link for that. And also, our, our, many of our growth groups are continuing online, so mark your connection card or um, contact the office. We can help you find out which groups are meeting online. And one of the things we're, we've still continued all throughout the pandemic is the lovely, wonderful flowers that we have adorning our altar. So thank you to all those who've gone the extra mile. It wasn't always easy in the very early days of the shutdown to get and maintain this flower process, but we did it. And so thank you to everybody who made that happen. So that means you can still um, purchase and dedicate flowers through the ordinary method. All right, today we're beginning a brand new message series. It's called Stay Positive. And if I had to tell you um, all of the six weeks of the message series in one sentence, it would basically be that God is so much bigger than all the negativity in the world. <laughs> and we're going to spend a lot of time digging into uh, discovering how we can tap into his joy, his goodness, his strength, his power that we have through the Holy Spirit. So that's what's coming up. Thank you for enduring all of those announcements. Right now I want to invite you to stand and sing our opening Worship him.
prove Christ is their life, their joy, their crown. Amen. So let us begin today by calling upon the name of our tri triune God, that name that unites us and defines us as God's people, that name that was placed on us in our baptisms, the name of one God in three persons, unity in Trinity and Trinity and unity. We begin in the name of our God, the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Friends, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us confess our sins to God. Almighty God, through Jesus our Lord, we have forgiveness and life. Yet we often refuse to live as your redeemed people. We sin against you in our thoughts, our words, and our actions. We follow our own sinful desires instead of living according to your word. Lord, we are reminded today in your word that you are the creator of all things. You made the heavens and the earth and made mankind and crowned us as the pinnacle over all your creation. So, Father, forgive us when we've not been good stewards of your creation. And we've not worshipped you as the one true God. We've made idols of ourselves and out of created things. And forgive us, Lord, when we have not made disciples of all nations. And forgive us, Father, when we have not loved our neighbors as ourselves and have not lived according to the name that was placed upon us in our baptism. And with the joy and the hope that comes from the Holy Spirit that dwells in us. Have mercy on us, Lord, and forgive us for Jesus' sake. May we again delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Friends, upon this, your confession, it is my joy to proclaim to you that Almighty God in His mercy has given His Son to die for you and for His sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by His authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, you've given us grace to acknowledge the glory of the eternal Trinity by the confession of a true faith and to worship the unity and the power of the divine majesty. Keep us steadfast in this faith and defend us from all adversities. For you, O Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, live and reign one God now and forever. Amen. So friends, it's in the joy and the knowledge that we are loved by God that we now prepare our hearts to hear and receive his word. You may be seated. The first reading is from Psalm 8. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens. Through the praise of children and infants, you have established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them, human beings that you care for them? You have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. You made them rulers over the works of your hands. You put everything under their feet, all flocks and herds and animals of the wild, the birds in the sky and the fish in the sea, all that swim the paths of the seas. Lord our God, how majestic is your name in all the earth. This is the word of the Lord. <clears throat> the second reading is from Acts 2. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth, 
was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. Fellow Israelites, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried, and his tomb is here to this day. But he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was to come, he spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, that he was not abandoned to the realm of the dead, nor did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of it. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has promised from the Father, the promised Holy Spirit, and has poured out what you now see and hear. For David did not ascend to heaven, and yet he said, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. This is the word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 28th chapter. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. Baptize them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. This is the Gospel of the Lord. You may be seated. Well, good morning. God's mercy, grace, and peace be with you today. Stay positive, that's the message title, and I don't want to start out sounding negative, but I'm kind of getting sick and tired of all the negative talk that's going on in the world today. Does anybody else feel that way? <laughs> it's it's uh, almost uh, getting overwhelming everywhere you look. Anytime you uh, turn on the news, uh, and then there's lately there's just really a lot of difficult news. It's a killer virus going around the world. People are either dying from it or hiding from it. Businesses have closed. Now, some are opening and some are struggling. Some won't open. Unemployment uh, is at an all-time high. Economy's struggling to come back. It's early, but it's still happening. And sadly, the nation remains divided politically, r- racially, and depending on who you talk to, it's the end of the world as we know it. The sky is falling. It's just bad news everywhere you look. So it's easy to get sucked into all that negativity and anxiety and fear, and it can be overwhelming. And if I'm really honest, there's times where I find myself emotionally on edge. I get easily angered and triggered. It's probably good that there's so much social distancing right now because I think all of us are a little more uh, riled up and anxious. And and there's times where I find myself more easily discouraged as well, wondering as as we look around, uh, can we make a dent in all the problems? Uh, Can we rebuild? Will we be able to get back to normal? Uh, Can we, is what we're doing matters? You can get get these feelings. 
So what I'm hoping we do today is we look to God to find some optimism. And in the middle of what seems to be so much negativity, an opportunity for hope uh, in the middle of all of that, when fear and negative emotions are running so high. So I don't know, have you done this thing? Uh, I've lost control of the things. But, uh. Have you done this thing uh, where you are actually looking for, um, you know, you get kind of negative about stuff, but then you actually look for five good things about every bad thing? Um, I know this exercise because uh, Rochelle makes me do it all the time. So I thought that this would be a good time for some coronavirus memes. It's not happening. Okay. Sorry about that. Uh, so here's some things, I think some good things that can come out of the um, coronavirus situation, all right? Like, for example, think of all of the things that you can do with that toilet paper that you have uh, gotten so stocked up on again, right? All kinds of good uses for that. And, uh, well, thanks to social distancing, it's a lot easier to find Waldo, right? That's a positive thing. Um, and I think, uh, I think I can say that we've all um, developed a new appreciation for stay-at-home moms. Uh, it's not the glam job that we thought it was. And, uh, you know, hey, when we do eventually get back to commuting to work and everything, getting honked at in traffic, I think uh, one day we'll remind a lot of folks of birthday drive-bys, right? And even uh, the very challenging uh, racial tension in our nation is helping us learn or we learn what really is important. So, when it comes to our faith, it's important for us to have an attitude that allows us to see God and to see good even in the middle of the bad. Because, plain and simple, we believe that even in the struggle of our life, God is still on his throne. He's still with us. He's still loving us. He's still watching out for us. And so, in these times, we choose faith instead of negativity. Because, and I'm going to give you throughout this morning, I'm going to give you just a few things uh, that you can kind of, kind of, like, just take home nugget sentences. And the first of these is, a negative outlook rarely leads to a positive life. I mean, whether you approach this all from a biblical perspective or not, it's kind of hard to argue with that true statement. And so what I want to do today is I'm going to show you why, as Christians, we are unshakably optimistic about the future. Unshakably optimistic. We can literally say, enough of the bad news, right? Because we know God. Amen? Amen. And if you're at home, use those heart buttons. It's just, it's a different perspective. Not the negative outlook. The positive outlook because we know about God. It's kind of what I'm calling optimism. I know that that phrase has maybe been, um, you know, socialized to mean different things. What I'm talking about today is I want to tell you about optimism because of Christ. All right? Now, let's, let me give you another sentence here of what optimism is not. When I'm talking about optimism, I'm not talking about denying reality, right? I'm not talking about putting our heads in the sand and acting like everything is just okay, and uh, the fact of the matter is we have very significant challenges all over the world. We don't have to deny those challenges in order to be optimistic. That's the first thing I want to say. That's what it's not. It's not just a denial of reality. And if I were to give you just a simple starting definition of optimism, it would be that optimism is confidence about the future. I'm going to leave you kind of hanging right there with that a little bit because it really depends and it begs the question, Confident, yes, but confident in what? And, and confident why? All right? That's what we're going to be talking about. So I'm just gonna, that's kind of the starting definition. To me, the place, the only place where we'll find confidence in the future is if we understand that God is the only one who holds his fu the future in his hands. So a better, more extended, if you will, Christian definition of optimism is Optimism is the unwavering expectation that our loving God is working in every situation for our future good, and our present good for that matter. So why don't you guys say this out loud with me, okay? This is the Christian definition that we're using this morning. Optimism is the unwavering expectation that our loving God is working every situation 
for our future good. He's working in it all together, okay? So when I say an unwavering expectation, I'm talking about a conviction that's deep within our soul. It, it doesn't move, doesn't shake, okay? It's an unwavering expectation that God is working in every situation. He's involved. He's present. He's working in things, and he's working things out for us. As a matter of fact, the Apostle Paul has, a, has said for us in Romans chapter 8, a very well-loved chapter of a verse of Scripture. It's this, that we know that in all things, can you say all things? All things. God works for the good of those who love him and have been called according to his purpose. All things. It might be the pandemic. But it might be the normal stuff in your life, like your difficult boss. It might be the racial tension in our country. But it might be your kid's homework. It might be the political landscape. But it might be figuring out how to actually get a haircut now. Okay? So it, God is working in all things, big things, insurmountable things, and the seemingly insignificant little things in all things. And by this, I mean, and what we're going to be talking about over these weeks is even the negative things. God is working for good. They may not be good now, but that's the confidence that we have is that even if it seems impossible to us, it's not impossible with God. So that makes us optimistic even with all the bad news. Now, what I want to do for you is ask you just to pause for a minute and think about what you think about. I know that sounds funny. Think about what you think about because what does your mind dwell upon? How do you think, how do you view the future? Do you only see bad outcomes? Do you only see the worst in things? Because the reality is if your thoughts are consumed by negativity and fear and worry and anxiety, it's not so good. Because here's another one of those sentences. What consumes your, consumes your mind or your thoughts? controls your life. What consumes your mind, controls your life. Or you could say it another way. Uh, and that is that the life you live is a reflection of the thoughts you think. Proverbs, kinds of tell, Proverbs tells us that. It says that as a man or a person thinks, so is he. So they are. The way we think comes out in our life. Our life is generally moving in the direction of our thoughts. And so if we tend to think that the world is always in trouble and you can't trust anyone, and you hate your circumstances, then you're probably not going to get to the end of too many days and say, wow, life is great, right? And that's why the quality of your life will never exceed the quality of your thoughts, your thinking, right? That's why, we, that's why we, we're talking about this this morning, okay? Because I got, I got a solution for that. We're not going nowhere with this. We're going to talk about how to... How to have spirit-filled thoughts. How to renew our minds in Christ Jesus. Now, so one of the problems that comes with this pessimism is uh, that it means that we tend to have a consistently chronic negative attitude. And worse than that, what, what pessimists can tend to do is make it both personal and permanent. And here's what I mean by that. They make it personal. They say, well, it's all my fault. This happened because I'm no good. I'm a failure. I'm unworthy. I'm not capable. I always mess things up. They make it personal. That's why things are bad. And then they extend it, and they tend to make it permanent. And they, they say, well, bad things always happen to me. It's never going to change. And this kind of thinking can turn into a victim mentality. And what happens is you're leading a negative life. And in today's environment, it might be things like, I'm never going to get that job that I want, that they're never going to get a cure for this virus. These race tensions will never be solved. The world's never going to be safe again. And on and on it goes. Do you see how this works? This negative mentality. All right? The quality of your life will never um, exceed the quality of your thoughts. So here's what we have to recognize, okay? And that is that being content feeling satisfied, being optimistic, feeling blessed, or just we'll just call that contentment, it isn't a state of affairs, it's a state of mind. Okay, it's not dependent on your circumstances, but on where you're looking for your security. That contentment that you want comes from where you have, where you find your peace, and where you find your hope. 
And if that's based on our Lord and on his goodness and on his power, and not on the world's craziness or your own limited ability to control it, then you're going to be, as the Apostle Paul says, content whatever the circumstances. I love this verse. Content, positive, whatever the circumstances, because it's not dependent. It's not a state of affairs. It's a state of mind. Um, it's not based on your circumstances. It's based on God. Because, friends, what consumes your thought controls your life. Therefore, as I suggested, you and I have a solution for that. We don't have to have all this what a fr pastor friend of mine calls stinking thinking. All right? We, we, can conf we don't have to conform to the pattern of, of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of our mind in Christ Jesus. And to go further, the Apostle Paul says, not to dwell on that negativity, but whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever's pure, whatever's lovely, whatever's admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about those things. Now, this isn't something that any of us do perfectly. If I'm honest with you, uh, I, uh, I have days where I'm very optimistic and then I have days where I'm very pessimistic. Just ask Rochelle. <laughs> I think some of it, though, I mean, to my defense, I think some of it is part of being a leader because as a leader, we often know too much. I mean, we just know the problems. We call it, we say, we, we know how the sausage is made. You know, sausage is good to eat, but you don't really want to know how it's made. And so as a leader, it, that can tend to be negative. Um, we also, a lot of times, we're living in the future. We just have to plan for the future and be looking ahead. And this can kind of, you know, uh, uh, we're, we're watching at home on Netflix, because yes, just like you, we're binge watching Netflix during the shutdown. Where else are you gonna go? But, you know, Danger Will Robinson. I do like the Lost in Space. Remix, um, remake or whatever. But all of that can tend to cause us to be negative and pessimistic, and I, I fall into that trap too. If you do tend towards the negative, though, here's my suggestion to you, okay? My suggestion is simply this. Feed your faith and starve your negativity, right? Because whatever you tend to feed grows and gets healthier, and whatever you tend to starve tends to die. So you and I want to starve the voices in our head that create that negativity. We want to feed the things that help us grow in faith. And this doesn't mean that we put our head in the sand, um, but it might mean you limit how much news you watch. I mean, it's no surprise if you're watching the news for six hours a day, then you can tend to get a little negative. Um, and if the circles of people that you tend to travel in are always negative, you were having a good day till you talked to them. That's the first sign, okay? You might want to limit your exposure to that, all right? And in the place of those negative things, feed your faith. And I'll tell you one thing that you can do to feed your faith is to spend more time in the Word of God. Take, for example, this section of Scripture that we're talking about today. Uh, we know that all things, in all things, God works together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Don't just, it's a great verse on its own, but if you really want to feed on the word of God, you want to spend less time in negativity and more time in the word, then you, gotta, you kind of dig in deeper, right? And then you say, all right, what's going on behind this verse? Spend some time and try to get an understanding of it. Who was this apostle Paul? What was going on in his life when he said that? When you dig deeper, you realize that Paul is really just a guy like you and me. And, and in fact, in Romans 7, the chapter before, he's saying things like about how broken and sinful he is. You know, all the good I want to do, I don't do that. All the bad I don't want to do, that's what I do. And so it's just a reminder for us. That's, what, that's the context. And then if you look in the book of Acts and you kind of dig into what was going on in, in Paul's life, you realize that, you know, he's writing these things, but he's been beaten. He's been thrown out of town. He's been thrown into jail. He's uh, been... Um, whipped and shipwrecked and somehow he writes these wonderful words and and others like what just a little earlier in the chapter he says this i consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us so apostle paul writes that he faces so much negativity i would ask you what's your present struggle your present suffering? Where are you hurting? What have you lost? What's grieving your soul? And then, perhaps because of what the Apostle Paul is saying, you can begin to look beyond your present suffering and realize that the struggle that you're in today is not even worth comparing against the glory that you're going to be part of tomorrow.
where the optimism comes from, right? The present struggle is not even worth comparing with the glory that's coming because we know, tying it together, your loving God is working every situation toward your future good or toward your good. You know that the struggle that you're in today is going to give way to something good. And as you do that, you starve in your fear and you're feeding your faith. And you might say, well, that's all great for the Apostle Paul. I mean, he's like an apostle. Uh, I'm not that strong. Well, God, once again, he's thought of everything. We talked about it last week on Pentecost Sunday. And that was the pouring out of the Holy Spirit. But what that Spirit means in us, that we have that Spirit poured out on us in our baptism, is it means that the Apostle Paul says that Spirit helps us in our weakness. I love this verse. Have I said how much I love Romans chapter 8? I warned you a few weeks ago that I'd be talking a lot about it. But look at that. The Spirit helps us in our weakness. So that means if you're feeling weak, if you're feeling overwhelmed, discouraged, like you can't take it anymore, the good news I have for you today, and it's different than good news you're going to find somewhere else, somewhere else is going to tell you, oh, you're feeling a little bit down, try harder, you know? Start the right diet plan. Just get out and exercise more, you know? Get better time management. Uh, sh find all those weaknesses. Shore them up. You know, get your life in order. That's how you're going to start feeling better. And I'm saying the good news for us is to follow Jesus, have his spirit in us, and that helps us in our weakness. And I think if we're honest with ourselves, we just take a, a stock of where we are today. If this coronavirus has shown us anything, it's shown us how powerless we are, how weak we are. And the riots and the civil unrest shows us how frustratingly out of control we are, and that doesn't matter which side of the issue you're on. So friends, the answer isn't hunker down, dig in, power through it, grit it out. No, the answer is to allow God's Holy Spirit to work in us and help us despite or even in our weakness. And I just want to say this. It's not that the Spirit works in those who deserve His work. The Spirit works in those who've earned His work. Or, the favorite one, God helps those who helps himself, help themselves. That is not in the Bible. No, it says God helps those who are weak. He helps those who need help. Weak people, sinful people, hurting people, frustrated people, people dealing with a lot of negative things in life. He helps them, and he works all things together for good. And he did that because his son endured a lot of bad, a lot of negativity for us. So friends, if you're facing a lot of negativity these days, remember that what controls your mind directs your life so let's you and me have a mind that's set on a loving God and who we know will never leave us or forsake us and who says that even those negative things, the present sufferings, aren't worth comparing to the glory that's going to be revealed in us who are in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen? Amen. Well, let's pray. Father, thank you for hope. Thank you that even when negativity is all around us, we can focus on you. And trust that you're, in wor you're working in every situation, no matter how hard or negative. Help us to have the confidence and the optimism that only you can provide. It's in Jesus' holy name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, friends, I invite you to stand now as together we profess that faith and that triune God who unites us gives us hope even in the face of negativity that Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So we profess, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead, he ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And so now let us join our hearts together in prayer. Lord God, 
In the beginning, Father, your word spoke all things into being, and from nothing you made all that is. Help us to see the imprint of your love and the goodness of creation and exercise responsible care of all that you've entrusted to us, especially loving care of our neighbor, regardless of their race or opinion. And Lord, through the ages, your spirit filled the sin-stained world with hope, and you call us to repentance and faith. And Lord, as you planned long before the world began, deliver us in Jesus Christ that we may be your own and live according to your commands all our days. Lord, you work through government and law to establish and preserve order. So we ask that you protect the weak and you foster godly virtue in all our leaders. Uh, bless our president, our governor, all who make, administer, and judge our laws and those who protect our f freedom and peace. Lord, deliver this world from the threats of pandemic and preserve the nations of our world. Bless all who defend us in the armed forces. Aid us in emergency field, in medical fields, excuse me, and hinder those who oppress any people with mistruth, violence, or fear. And Lord, in the hour of our trial and the moment of trouble, you're there. You hear us as we cry out to you for the sake of the sick, the troubled in mind, the wounded in heart, for those who grieve. We pray especially today for healing for Karen, Patricia, and Gail. We thank you, Lord, for Liam's successful surgery. I ask for his further healing. Uh, we thank you also that Emma, eight years old, did well in her brain surgery and is still being closely monitored, so we pray for her healing. And Lord, we thank you that Megan and um, Ryan had a healthy baby girl. Lord, we lift up to you Dave's mom, Esther, with COVID-19, um, a, a senior in uh, isolation in a nursing facility in L.A., also Dora, Lift, list, living in an assisted facility with many cases. And for Ellen, uh, who's a social worker in a nursing facility that has a large amount of death and has a lot of COVID-19 patients, for all those in the medical and caregiving professions, Lord, lift them up and keep them safe. We pray for the protection of our National Guard troops being uh, deployed uh, to, the, to the riots and the um, places uh, across the United States where they're needed. Um, we pray also for police and fire departments who are working around the clock to protect communities. We pray for those experiencing injustice and those protesting on their behalf. Lord, we pray for safety. We pray for healing for our country. Lord, we pray that you would deliver these and us from all afflictions according to your will and sustain us in hope with patience and strength for the day. And Lord, in this blessed supper, your son has offered us his body and blood as the cup of salvation. We ask that you help us to receive this sacrament with faith, and especially after such a long time away from your house, now gathered in community to receive this sacrament, we pray that we would do so with joyful hearts that show forth the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. So into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray. We trust in your love and mercy through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Friends, our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke the bread and he gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This is the cup of my blood in the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And friends, since we're doing things in a little bit of a different order today, 
Before uh, we commune and dismiss, I just want to say that it's been a blessing to be here with you today. I pray that our time has been helpful for you. Um, I want to encourage you. Um, you may be seated, by the way. Uh, I want to encourage you. Uh, if you haven't filled out that connection card, you can do that at home. Uh, make an offering online or drop it on the way out. Um, online Sunday school for the kids, Wednesday study and prayer, um, and growth groups, okay? Now let me tell you what's going to happen for communion because it's so different today, okay? Uh, so for the sake of those around you, I ask that you keep your masks up while singing and walking. The ushers are going to guide you not up the center aisles, uh, but by half pew first. So the idea is you don't have to cross over anybody and you don't have to walk through big, long aisles. So just follow the ushers. They're going to be kind of more or less pointing at you rather than releasing whole rows. So if you just, if you just think about that, you'll be in good shape. Uh, so the ushers are going to guide you, and you're going to be queuing up. I'm sure you're used to this from the grocery store and other places. We've got lines, two different queues, depending on which way you're coming up. Um, just don't, you know, get any closer than the lines until the person in front of you moves. Um, also, uh, since you are going to be um, going directly out of the church after communion today, I encourage you to bring your belongings with you. If you do have anything with you that you want to set down, there are some chairs and pews there that you might be able to take advantage of that. Um, also, if you'd like to have some hand sanitizer right before you commune, that's right there. Um, the elder and myself will be wearing masks and gloves and distributing the elements in individual containers that have been prepared and they're in individual cups. So you are going to be uh, picking up the cup for yourself. I'm not going to be putting anything into your hands. Um, the same thing with the wine. The challenge that we have is if you're at this line, if you could make a look at me and the elder, and if you need gluten-free bread, if you could kind of just close your hand, because if you do this, I'm going to just think you're waving. So gluten-free, and if you just, I know this is kind of, I have to come up better than the bar drinking symbol, but if you kind of catch Doug and you kind of go like that, he'll know that you mean non-alcoholic wine. So maybe we should do this for the alcoholic wine and then the non-alcoholic wine doesn't, doesn't do anything. I don't know. Uh, so, and then you'll be picking up the cups by yourself, consuming right in front of this table uh, that Hilda has prepared so nicely for us, and then there'll be a garbage receptacle there for your waste containers as you exit out. And um, if for any reason you are coming back in this direction, we, we actually encourage you to go back to the lobby. Like if you need something from the supply table, um, go outside and do it so that people from communion don't just follow you back into the church. <laughs> We're not going back to our seats after communion today. Uh, lower your face to consume the elements. And um, if you're not communing, uh, when the usher gets to you, they will guide you to just leave out the rear of the sanctuary so you don't have to wait all the way in the line. And if you do have difficulty walking, you're, we're not going to be ascending the stairs, but even if this walk is difficult for you, just stay in your seats and at the end of communion, we'll come forward and bring communion to you. So that's it for the instructions. Now, as we prepare to receive communion and to conclude our service today, my prayer for you is that you would starve those negative voices in your life and feed the Spirit through time and God's word. And that, uh, so you can stay positive, excuse me, even in a world of negativity. And if you know somebody who'd benefit from this, okay, why not tell them about the video online or invite them to join you next week. Until then, have a safe and healthy week. Don't let the enemy or the uncertainty of this world steal your joy. Now, receive the blessing of the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. And so now, as guided by the ushers, you are welcome at the Lord's table.
the works thy hand hath made. I see the stars, I hear the mighty thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art. I scarce can take it in that on the cross my burden gladly bearing he bled and died to take away my sin then sings my soul my sin How great thou art, then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. When Christ shall come, with shout of acclamation and take me home what joy shall fill my heart then i shall bow in humble adoration and there proclaim my god how great thou art then sings my soul my savior god to thee how great thou art how great thou art then sings my soul my savior god to thee 